Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing. Tonight, thousands fall prey to a cyber attack on the Canada Revenue Agency. If they can get into my CRA account, they can also access my bank account now. How it's left some Canadians high and dry. The Western COVID surge, the struggle to get the message through in BC, and a concerning contact tracing delay in Alberta. Just sort of makes you question the whole system. Anger over temporary homeless shelters in Toronto and what the city is doing about it. And as the Conservative Party prepares to pick their new leader, the stakes for the party and the government. This is The National. Millions of Canadians have been relying on government programs to help get through the pandemic, but all of a sudden access for new applicants has been shut down. That response from the Canada Revenue Agency after cyber attacks on government websites left thousands of people vulnerable to identity theft. The agency confirmed today that roughly 5,500 CRA accounts have been compromised and even more at Service Canada. Simon Nakaneshny shows us how that's causing anxiety and hardship. In early August, Kat Barron went online to apply for her third payment from the Canada Emergency Student Benefit. With two kids and an aging father to care for, money is tight. But when she tried to log into the CRA website, she was blocked. I was told that their, my account has been hacked and that they had to lock it down. The CRA now admits it's been hit by two separate cyber attacks. About 5,500 accounts are affected and the RCMP is investigating. From the research we're doing, it looks like it's an organized uh, crime groups that are doing it just to capitalize on uh, COVID and the uh, payments between uh, governments to citizens. The CRA blames the fraud, at least partially, on what it calls previous third-party data breaches. A practice called credential stuffing involves using the stolen login information from one website to access another, like the CRA's. It works because people often use the same password for many websites. Right. But Dave McChrystal says he doesn't do that. He has a special username, password and security questions just for the CRA website. That didn't stop someone from changing his banking info and claiming two months of the Canada Emergency Response Benefit in his name. The only reason that I was alerted to this happening at all was because I got an email from the CRA saying my email address had been changed. Um, if I hadn't received that email, I would have never known. McChrystal changed his information back before the payments went through. So now he's sitting on $4,000 in benefits, awaiting instructions on how to send it back. Kat Barron says she could really use the student and child benefit payments now on hold. We're just going to call the bill collectors and hold them off for as long as we can. The CRA says it will send instructions to victims like Barron on how to restore their online accounts by way of a slower, low-tech method, a letter in the mail. Simon Akineshny, CBC News, Montreal. The number of confirmed COVID-19 cases in Canada rose today to more than 122,000. Ontario reporting the biggest jump with 81 new cases, followed by Quebec with 67. 36 were reported in Manitoba, where the number of cases has been surging lately. And while neither British Columbia nor Alberta release new COVID-19 numbers today, both are dealing with setbacks in their fight to contain the virus. Briar Stewart begins in British Columbia, where parties and other large gatherings are a problem. In parks along Vancouver's seawall this afternoon, there were plenty of groups, but mostly spaced out. Okay. It was a different story on Friday night on Granville Street, where there was an impromptu street party complete with the DJ. It's these kinds of images that frustrate Kyla Lee. People really are not being smart about this. Lee contracted COVID-19 back in March, but her symptoms, including a fever and rash, have come back repeatedly. She says it's baffling that people aren't taking the virus more seriously. And to me, it just, it's, it's so selfish. Like you're putting everybody's life at risk because you can't handle the idea of having one summer where you don't party. There has been a surge of cases in BC recently. The province says many have been connected to private parties, but there's been a number of exposure warnings at local bars and clubs. You see tons of people. You see tons of people out. And the psychologist says people letting their guard down can fuel more complacency. People use social norms to figure out what is the appropriate thing to do. 
more so than they use abstract numbers. So if you see a lot of people doing something, it seems like more and more people think that that's appropriate. Next door in Alberta, cases have also gone up, and along with that, concerns around contact tracing. Adam McRae's family took precautions, but his pregnant wife and their toddler tested positive for COVID. It took eight days for a contact tracer to get in touch, and only after McRae took to social media. It was also a little disheartening to hear that they have a backlog, and we were really hoping we were just like falling, falling through the cracks. Just sort of makes you question the whole system. Health officials had always warned about a potential second wave come the fall, but more cases now before the start of school lead to concerns around just what could happen come September. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. This year with the pandemic, vacations often mean staying close to home, and that can include spending time on the water. And as we've been seeing this summer, it comes with risks. Kelda Yoon now with the scene of one Toronto beach today after a tragic weekend. Search teams were back at Toronto's Bluffers Park today. What began as a rescue became a challenging recovery effort. The waters are fairly rough. There are a lot of rocks. The conditions were similar yesterday when two brothers in the water signaled for help. One was rescued but died in hospital. The other is who divers spent the day looking for. Abdullah Mosley remembers the waves. Uh, it was pretty heavy. Yeah, that's what it was really wavy. This was just one of three incidents at the beach Saturday. The body of a man was pulled from the water earlier in the evening. A few hours later, a young boy needed help. Two men who rushed to his rescue, both injuring themselves in the current. It was as rescuers were assisting them that they got the call about the brothers. Bluffers Park is one of Toronto's busiest beaches where there has had to be strict enforcement during the pandemic. A parking here has been restricted since April when crowds forced the beach to be shut down. Barbara Byers from the Life Saving Society says the pandemic is likely changing habits. So while the pools are open, they have limited space that you have to reserve a spot. So it may be that people find it you know, harder to go to pools to swim, so they're going to the beach. There, conditions can be unpredictable and there can be fewer lifeguards. Byers says 70% of all drownings happen in open water. So far this year, both British Columbia and Quebec have seen increases in drowning deaths. Quebec and Ontario have seen the most drownings. Last Tuesday, three family members drowned at Crescent Falls on the Bighorn River in Alberta. One was swept under the falls. The other two tried to help. Byers says one of the most important things to remember if you get in trouble is never fight the current. If you try and go back the way you came, you're going to be exhausted. So you want to go with it, but start angling yourself towards the shore. Kelda Yoon, CBC News, Toronto. Today in northwestern Ontario, nearly 4,000 evacuees began returning home to the town of Red Lake. The forest fire that forced them out was contained as of yesterday, officials said. Some Friday night rainfall was a big help. The residents began to flee several days ago when flames were just two kilometers away from the community. That new 10% import tariff on Canadian aluminum imposed by the United States took effect today. President Donald Trump has accused Canadian producers of flooding the American market. The tariff means everything from cars and auto parts to beer and pop cans will be more expensive for U.S. consumers. Canada's promise to retaliate with dollar-for-dollar -dollar surcharges on American aluminum products. Congressional Democrats are being called back from break to scrutinize cuts to the U.S. Postal Service that could have an impact on the presidential election. This comes as the Democratic Convention, the formal selection of the nominees Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, take place online. Here's Paul Hunter. For a sense of how things will play out in Milwaukee this week at the Democratic National Convention, consider the last time they had such a get-together. 2016, as Hillary Clinton, with a broad smile and the confidence of certainty, and all that hoopla accepted her nomination to run for the White House. It won't be like that this time. Joe Biden will accept his nomination by video. Because of COVID concerns, he'll be in faraway Delaware. Likewise, most of the other speakers from all parts of the country will show up on screen only.
Still, said former presidential hopeful Bernie Sanders today, the focus for Democrats remains the same. In this moment, we have got to do everything we can to come together to defeat Donald Trump, who in my view is the most dangerous president in the modern history of this country, and elect Joe Biden. Meanwhile, as the COVID threat also fuels the move toward voting by mail, anger this weekend outside the home of the U.S. Postmaster General, Louis DeJoy, a Trump appointee, who, by the way, is married to Trump's choice to be the new ambassador to Canada. Critics allege recent cuts at the post office are politically driven, aimed at disrupting mail-in voting. Democrats now want DeJoy to come testify on Capitol Hill. To slow down the mail at any time is disgraceful. To slow it down at COVID is despicable. Donald Trump will also be in the spotlight this week. His campaign is spending millions in online advertising to go head to head with the Democratic convention. Trump's also planning a big event, timed for the same day Biden accepts his nomination. A speech in Scranton, Pennsylvania, Biden's birthplace. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Donald Trump mused about delaying the U.S. election, but the Constitution essentially prohibits that. In New Zealand, though, the Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern is delaying her country's vote by four weeks. In the end, what matters most is what is in the best interests of voters in our democracy. The country is in the midst of a new coronavirus outbreak with at least 69 active cases. Her announcement means the election set for September the 19th will now be held on October 17th. There is a new sense of urgency about being homeless in Canada. As the pandemic drags on, more and more renters could face eviction. Already large encampments have popped up in some cities. And as Vic Adopi explains, the fear is those numbers will only grow. Norman Black had never been homeless before, but that changed last month when he had a severe panic attack, a chronic problem. So he left his apartment for good in the middle of a pandemic. I was losing my mind, just staring at the walls. So I chose my mind over my home, but I was so naive that I didn't realize how hard it is for homelessness. Visible encampments like Black's now number more than 100 in Toronto because of the pandemic. And there are worries they'll grow as more provinces begin lifting bans that had prevented landlords from evicting tenants. I have personally handed out tents to people that are just recently evicted. After outbreaks in homeless shelters, beds have been moved farther apart, often leading to fewer beds in a system that's already stretched. Every single time I call, uh, I can't get a bed for anyone. The beds are full. So uh, it's really hard as a worker um, and as a priest uh, to see people in these dire situations. And, the, you know, the best I can do is offer them a used tent. The City of Toronto has set up temporary housing for homeless people in apartments and hotels. But for those with mental illness and addictions, many end up leaving or getting kicked out, winding up back in tents and hanging on by a thread. And that thread is now snapped. The street doctor um, says with access to social services reduced because of physical distancing, the consequences have been damaging. Many people are more socially isolated than ever before. We're seeing a worsening of, of uh, symptoms um, like depression and psychosis, for example. And what I've seen with my own eyes is a strong desire for people who have mental illness to be more connected. For now, this encampment has helped keep Norman Black connected to offer some sense of community, though he knows the outbreak's second wave and colder weather loom. I gotta find some place. Yeah, I don't wanna be here. God, no. Vicadopia, CBC News, Toronto. Hoping to stop the spread of COVID-19 among homeless people, Toronto is in the midst of a big move. The city has leased several buildings as temporary shelters, three in just one neighbourhood. And as Talia Ricci explains, that's driving a wedge in the community. Tax the rich and build social housing. On one side, advocates, people experiencing homelessness and community members who support them. Without this place here, um, you know, there would be people sleeping on the sidewalks people sleeping in building staircases, and that would be worse. 
On the other, area residents who say they don't feel safe. This has always been a safe and peaceful community. We've even had homeless people in the community. But what we're witnessing right now is not normal. In one week, there was a stabbing at one of the shelters, an overdose death and a fire. Residents say there's also been an uptick in business break-ins. We're not getting the proper action. I really appreciate seeing the extra police in the area because now I can go for a walk. Many in support of the shelter say more empathy is needed. There's a lot of misconception and the greatest being that, uh, you know, everyone is a drug addict or has a mental health issue. The majority of people just need housing. The city says it's in discussions with both area residents and the shelters. It's taking steps to address some of the community's concerns like additional security, health supports, and a team to help clean up hazards like needles. Experts say that communication is important. I think what's really critical is that there is kind of democratic engagement and consultation across neighborhoods, um, across communities who are dealing with a new um, new space in which they're all collectively operating. Frontline workers say the pandemic has simply made an existing problem more visible. Shelter client Steve Longfield says he understands the community's concerns, but would like his new neighbors to know. It's hard. It's not easy. We're not all bad. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. There is outrage again tonight in Belarus. <laughs> Next on The National, hundreds of thousands protest in the face of a defiant president. Why Russia is now getting involved. The quick-thinking husband who saved his wife by punching a great white shark. That's all I could think was just get off. <laughs> Holy. And the Canadian toddler turned international golf sensation. We'll be right back. Anger and defiance reached new heights today in Belarus, one week after an election that many believe was fraudulent. Farah Morali shows us the mass outrage and looks at the new wild card in the mix, Russian leader Vladimir Putin. In the heart of the capital city, a sea of protesters fills the streets. They're demanding the resignation of Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko. I spent all my life with President Lukashenko and I don't want it anymore. Anger is growing over allegations last Sunday's election was rigged and police violence at protests. At least two protesters have died and thousands have been detained. Earlier today, a smaller rally in support of Lukashenko. He rejected calls for a new election, saying the opposition would, quote, crawl like rats out of a hole if he bowed to pressure. He also accused NATO of building up troops at the border. NATO tanks and jets are on standby, he said, within 15 minutes reach of our borders. NATO has denied that claim. Lukashenko insists he took 80% of the votes fair and square. But EU foreign ministers are moving toward imposing sanctions on the regime. As protests escalate, the big question is, what might Russia do? Lukashenko has been in talks with Vladimir Putin and says Russia is willing to step in with security assistance. Mr. Putin fears more than anything a democratic state on its borders. Oral Braun keeps a close watch on developments and says they're reminiscent of what happened in Ukraine in 2014. The interesting and the frightening question in some ways is at some point, if we reach that kind of tipping point, what kind of decision will Lukashenko make? Will he view being pushed out of power more dangerous than having Russians come in and essentially give up most of his power? We will not go away. Today, tomorrow, week, uh, next week, we will stay here on the streets. Despite the threat of Russian military intervention, anti-government protesters say they're not going anywhere. Farah Morali, CBC News, Toronto. An Australian woman is in serious condition after a great white shark attacked her off the coast in New South Wales over the weekend. She was conscious and breathing. Um, she seemed to be doing fairly well considering um, the lacerations to her leg. Her husband is the one who saved her, paddling out on his own surfboard to face the shark and punching it until it released his wife's leg. 
you see the mother of your child and your support, everything that's who you are. And so you just react. The beaches in the area were immediately closed and a search began for the shark. This is the third attack in the region in the last few months. The U.S. National Weather Service says it's investigating several reports of fire tornadoes yesterday in Northern California. This dangerous and rare occurrence likely sparked from the nearby Loyalton wildfire close to the Nevada border. As of tonight, that fire remains just 5% contained. Mandatory evacuations are in place for several counties. And a cargo ship leaking oil off the coast of Mauritius is now split in two. The Japanese carrier struck a coral reef last month and has been spilling hundreds of tons of fuel oil ever since. The country's prime minister has declared a state of environmental emergency, though we still don't know the full impact of the spill. Next, the Conservative leadership race is in its final stretch. With just seven days to go, we look at what's at stake for the candidates and the party. Oh! And he's just two years old and already an award-winning golfer. Welcome back. The Conservative Party is set to elect its new leader a week from tonight. It is a leadership race that has been anything but usual, with the pandemic changing how candidates campaigned and drawing out the contest for two extra months. Well, Mr. Speaker, it looks like my last question period as leader of the Conservative Party is, is just like my first. Warm, sunny, and the Prime Minister nowhere to be found. <laughs> that was Andrew Scheer earlier this week during his final appearance in the House of Commons as leader of the official opposition. Now four candidates are vying to replace him. Former Cabinet Ministers Peter McKay and Aaron O'Toole, political newcomer Leslin Lewis, and first-time MP Derek Sloan. Ten months into a Liberal minority, the stakes are high for the Conservatives. The global pandemic, of course, an economic crisis, and a government facing yet another controversy, all factors that could play into how members vote. The process is already underway by mail. Party members will use a ranked ballot system. The winner needs at least 50% plus one to win. If that doesn't happen on the first ballot, we could see up to three more rounds. So how is the race shaping up? Joining us now, Chris Hall, the CBC's National Affairs Editor and host of CBC Radio's The House. And Chris, what have you been hearing as the main issues uh, during this, this leadership campaign? Well, it's interesting. A lot of it started with whether the campaign itself should go ahead because of the COVID-19 pandemic. The June convention had to be canceled. The campaigns had to reorient how they were going to reach out to the members. The good news is that 100,000 new members signed up, and uh, that's, that's a sign that conservatives are engaged. I think the big issue right now is uh, just what to do about the economy, how they can replace the Liberals and win in areas like Ontario and Quebec and Atlantic Canada, which were really uh, very difficult, just toehold in each of those three uh, areas of the country. So uh, looking at sort of the alternatives they're putting forward it's on climate change, on energy, really trying to distinguish themselves from each other. Although they really, if you look at their campaign platforms, they're, they're really alike on some of those main issues, but trying to distinguish themselves from the Liberals as well. I know it's always important uh, when the official opposition chooses its leader, but what about for the Conservatives right now? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? It's really important with the, the polls beginning to suggest that the we uh, charity issues are beginning to strike at the popularity uh, of the Liberal Party and the Prime Minister's own brand. Uh, it's important, obviously, to try and be able to keep that momentum going uh, once you're the leader after next weekend. So I think that's a big part of it. But frankly, you know, another issue for the Conservatives and always has been is trying to maintain party unity. There are four candidates running. Uh, there is a division still. Some of them are really social conservatives. Others like Peter McKay are not. Uh, and there's also the question about what to do out west. The party's base is there, but the Wexit movement, the threat of a potential separatist party running in the next federal election, all of that has to be dealt with immediately. Andrew Shear on the House this weekend telling me that he sees that as a real challenge. That's to be dealt with directly and immediately. And is there any way of, of gauging who the frontrunner might be now? 
Uh, it's difficult. It's a ranked preferential ballot, but I did talk to a number of the campaigns today and other people who were involved in organizing this leadership race. Peter McKay is seen as the putative front runner, but you know, with more than one ballot likely, if he doesn't get 50 percent plus one, then you have to wonder what are the second ballot choices for some of the people who begin to drop off. So it's hard really to handicap this, but as it stands right now, Leslin Lewis, who is a, a brand new political newcomer, is uh, doing much better, I think, than most people thought. Uh, Aaron O'Toole is the MP from the Durham area. He's doing well, getting lots of money. They've signed up all these members. And Derek Sloan, the fourth one, really appealing on a single issue kind of social campaign, social issues campaign. So we'll have to see how those people, if he drops off first, where his people go, if they go anywhere at all on subsequent ballots. Always so nice to have your analysis. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, and good to see you. So with the Conservative leadership race entering its final stretch, the National will be profiling all four of the candidates throughout the week, starting tonight with the candidate who had this to say shortly after his party's loss after the last election. Yeah, to use a good Canadian analogy, it was like having a breakaway on an open net and missing the net. <laughs> it was that moment that fueled leadership rumors around Peter McKay, a familiar name to many of us, as he tries to make a political comeback. Here's Power and Politics host Vashi Capellos. I talk to Canadians everywhere. Peter McKay always predicted he'd never stray far from politics. One thing I did learn from Josh Ray is you never say never. Uh, you never close doors. That was all the way back in 2001, before he ran for the leadership of the then Progressive Conservative Party of Canada. What a night. <laughs> he won that race in 2003, but it was a brief leadership. By the end of the year, the PC party merged with the Canadian Alliance, led by Stephen Harper. Though some of McKay's colleagues claimed he betrayed them, McKay insisted that wasn't the case. It's the policy and it's the people and the direction that this new party will take that I believe will convince those who have their reservations that this is progress. McKay didn't challenge Harper for the leadership of the newly merged party. Mr. Peter Gordon McKay. When the party came to power in 2006, McKay began a ministerial career that would see him lead significant portfolios, foreign affairs, defense, and justice. <laughs> McKay was first elected in 1997 in the same riding once held by his father. Elmer McKay was a senior minister under former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney. I didn't grow up with a burning desire to be a politician. I mean, I was around politics. Yeah. Um, I had vicarious experience through my father. And now Peter McKay has come back to politics after a five-year absence. His message? A progressive one. People need to see themselves in this party. It needs to modernize. We have to have a comprehensive plan for the environment. It's not enough to just say we'll get rid of the carbon tax. We have to say what we'll do to address escalating greenhouse gas emissions. And we have to reach out to younger generation. I am pro-choice. I'm for equal marriage. I am willing to march in a parade, but people want to talk about the economy. Whether that will resonate with Tory members, well, McKay will find out soon. Vashi Capello, CBC News, Ottawa. And we will have more on the Conservative leadership race through the week, what you need to know about the other candidates and what's at stake for the party. And all of that leading up to next Sunday, our chief political correspondent, Rosemary Barton, will host special coverage on CBC Television, CBC News Network and CBC GEM. We'll have the results and analysis throughout the evening, followed by a special ad issue panel right here on The National. Boeing 737 MAX was grounded long before the pandemic, but now it is one step closer to returning to the sky. Next, the view from the cockpit and from insiders on what led to the deadly crashes and whether anyone will ever be held accountable. This month, U.S. aviation authorities released a wide range of fixes for Boeing's 737 MAX jets. The planes have been grounded since the spring of 2019 after two deadly crashes within a six-month period. Given the amount of work still required, it's not clear when the planes will return to service. But the company has already conducted some test flights. Boeing used to represent the gold standard in aircraft safety, but critics say it lost its way in the pursuit of profit. Earlier this season, the Fifth Estate looked at the inner workings of the company and why experts say those two crashes could have been prevented. Here's Terrence McKenna. Cradle me, I'll cradle you. 
This is the story of Danielle Moore, a 24-year-old marine biologist from Scarborough, Ontario, and her parents, Clarice and Chris. Just for your eyes. Danielle is such a good kid. I'll be yours and you'll be. After working all over Canada on environmental issues, Danielle was invited to a UN conference last March in Nairobi, Kenya. She connected in Addis Ababa onto Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302. The phone rang at 6 o'clock here in the morning. They said, um, it's, uh, it's about Danielle. They said the plane crashed and I... <laughs> Clarissa just screamed out, Danielle's dead. That, that minute I knew I was dead. I was just, you know, forever. Everything's changed. The plane crashed into a field about 30 miles from the airport. It hit the ground at over 500 miles per hour. There were immediate comparisons to another Boeing 737 MAX flight that crashed in Indonesia just over four months earlier. Both planes crashed because of a flight control system called MCAS, the Maneuvering Characteristics Augmentation System, which was designed to push the aircraft nose down in the event of a stall. The existence of the MCAS system was concealed from pilots, part of an effort to save airlines money on pilot training. We asked two American Airlines pilots to come to a Boeing 737 simulator to make a detailed assessment of what the pilots faced in the minutes leading up to the crashes. Captains Dennis Tager and Jason Goldberg have been flying 737s for many years. Lion Air Flight 610 took off from runway 25 of the Jakarta Airport at 6.20 on the morning of October 29, 2018. There were 189 people on board. So at the very first step of the flight, once they lifted off the ground, they had an immediate stick shaker, and it would be on the captain's side. This would be going off continuously. This is an indication to the pilot that the aircraft is about to stall and action is needed. This would not stop. Two minutes into the flight, the plane banked left to follow the assigned course. Banking, banking. Another alarm went off in the cabin, indicating they were turning too sharply. Low, airspeed, low, airspeed, low. That is the startle factor, the tsunami that's hitting the pilot. And he hasn't even gotten to this beast known as MCAS. 10 seconds later, the captain requested the first officer to partially retract the flaps. When the flaps came up is when the monster came out of the cage. The retraction of the flaps would trigger the MCAS system. The system was misreading data from a faulty angle of attack sensor mounted on the exterior of the aircraft nose. MCAS would move the horizontal portion of the tail to push the plane nose down. So this MCAS system would run for 10 seconds and take five seconds off. And five, four, three, two, one, bang. And then it comes in with its 10 second run back down. The Lion Air pilots pulled back their control columns as the plane began to dive. You're literally trying to wrestle the airplane. At a certain point, it would be like trying to, trying to move a wall. In the last minute of the Lion Air flight, the dive became unrecoverable. At the end of October in Washington, D.C., Crash victims' relatives arrived to see Boeing CEO Dennis Mullenberg testify before a congressional committee and answer some tough questions about the 737 MAX crashes. The biggest question uh, in my mind is why didn't you ground the plane after the first accident? We, we've asked ourselves that question many, many times. And uh, if, we, uh, if we knew back then uh, what we know now, we would have grounded right after the first accident. But it turns out Boeing did know back then most of what it knows now. This Boeing internal document showed that in June 2018, four months before the first crash, 
Boeing engineers warned that pilots would have only four seconds to see MCAS was triggered by mistake and only 10 seconds to correct it, otherwise there would be a catastrophic crash. When pilots learn that information that is of a critical safety system is not released to us, then we get very disturbed by it. Newest arrival in the Boeing family of airliners, the 737 attracts a crowd. At one time, Boeing had a sterling reputation for safety, but many present and former employees say that began to change when the company was amalgamated with the McDonnell Douglas Corporation in 1997. Longtime Boeing scientist Stan Sorcher and Cynthia Cole witnessed the compromise of safety. The McDonnell Douglas managers were more cutthroat, and it was all about the bottom line, the, the financial, you know, cut those costs. Their profits were more important. In that business model, nobody ever says no. You're just going to follow the plan. That's the Walmart business model. They didn't follow a good capitalist model. They followed greed. The safety of these aircraft is supposed to be overseen during the manufacturing process by independent representatives of the FAA, the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration. In recent years, however, supposedly to save money and streamline the process, much of that oversight has been contracted out to personnel paid directly by Boeing. To many of the people who work here, that represents an obvious conflict of interests. Well, the downside is someone can threaten your position at work. You can, you can be, you know, play ball or else. And the managers could say, you know, you keep your mouth shut or you lose your job. So it isn't just salary, it's your salary increase, it's your assignments. You could be reassigned uh, to another thing. You could be replaced by somebody who is less uh, capable of resisting pressure. Relatives who have lost loved ones, if you could please stand so we could thank you all. Thank you for being here. If you could just uh, stand. Mr. Muhlenberg, as I watch those loved ones stand, my anger has only grown. These loved ones lost lives because of an accident that was not only preventable, but was the result of a pattern of deliberate concealment. Boeing came to my office shortly after these crashes and said they were the result of pilot error. Those pilots never had a chance. These loved ones never had a chance. They were in flying coffins as a result of Boeing deciding that it was going to conceal MCAS from the pilots. S Senator, if, if anything I can leave with you today, I want to reinforce the culture of safety at Boeing. Dennis Mullenberg repeatedly emphasized his commitment to safety and the values he was taught as an Iowa farm boy. Grown up on a farm in Iowa, my parents taught me the value of hard work and integrity. At the conclusion of the hearings, the mother of one victim confronted the Boeing CEO. Well, you talked about Iowa just like one too many times, and the whole group said, go back to the farm. Go back to Iowa. Do that. You're not the person anymore to solve the situation. But I want to say it to you directly, because I don't think you understand what we're saying. I, I, I respect that. I really do. In the end, it's about safety. and I. Even I if you're not capable of doing that. I, I respect your, your inputs there. I just tell you, we are very focused on safety. You know, Boeing are capitalist extremists. They're right at the far end, and they're just, there's no safety that they're looking at. And, and it's just, I can't believe it. This is corporate manslaughter, you know? I just learned that today. After the second crash, after the Ethiopian airline flight, 8302 who killed our daughter, who murdered our daughter. He got a bonus. How would I feel? There are doubts that Congress will do much to rein in Boeing, especially because the company spends millions of dollars lobbying politicians. 
including campaign contributions to many members of the House Transportation Committee. Do you understand how the rest of the world thinks the whole system is broken? You know, Boeing's not telling the truth, the FAA seems to be out of the, the loop, the senators and congressmen seem to be on the pay of Boeing. The whole system seems broken. Well, the system is broken right now because the FAA has to be changed in its culture. It has to end outsourcing and a system that, in effect, puts the fox in charge of the hen house. The, the system is not broken. Uh, however, At hearings in December, the new FAA administrator, Stephen Dixon, tried to defend the integrity of his organization. He had trouble explaining this internal study from December 2018, three months before the second crash, showing that the FAA estimated that if the MCAS was not fixed, the system would likely cause more than 15 crashes over the 45-year life of the 737 MAX fleet, causing almost 3,000 fatalities. At the time, that information was not shared with the airlines or the public. Is the system broken? Oh, clearly it failed. The system, the certification system failed our pilots, it failed our passengers, and it failed the globe. Recently released internal emails show many Boeing employees had lost faith in the 737 MAX long before the crashes. In 2017, one said the airplane was designed by clowns, supervised by monkeys. Dennis Mullenberg was removed as Boeing CEO just before Christmas, and Boeing has now admitted that pilot training on the MAX would be a good idea after all. There is a U.S. Justice Department investigation of the company's interaction with the FAA, looking to see if there was criminal activity leading to the crashes. But many doubt that any Boeing executives will be prosecuted. No. I, I, I think that all these people in these upper echelons are too related and too intertwined. I don't think they're going to find anything against one of their own. The problem with you know, people have died. And for um, Boeing to pay a fine or to pay millions or whatever, where's the justice? In late October, Clarice Moore traveled to Ethiopia to bring back her daughter's coffin and the partial remains that were identified. I want to open up that coffin. I want to see her. I want to hug her, I want to smell her, I want to kiss her, I want to dance with her, I want to hear her voice. I just want to um, continue to be the voice of Danielle and bring awareness to the public. That way, this will never happen to them. Gonna miss the way I walk, gonna miss the way I talk, but you know you're gonna miss Terence McKenna, CBC News, Toronto. Not surprisingly, Boeing has had a tough time on the financial markets. After the grounding of its 737 MAXs in 2019 and then the pandemic, the company's stock lost more than 60% of its value in March. Even after showing some signs of recovery, it remains more than 45% down from a year ago. Time for a quick break, and the moment is next. The Canadian toddler with an award-winning golf swing. Oh! If you've been working on your golf swing this summer, you might want to take a couple of pointers from this kid. At just two years old, Jack Canton from Noelleville, Ontario, won an international golf swing contest. His form and dedication to the sport makes that swing our moment tonight. Oh, man. Whoa, wow! It's been exciting to see him grow, uh, you know, with something like, like golf uh, or, or any sport, really. Um, He's, he's just very passionate about most things and his determination and his hard work uh, comes through. And it's definitely what he's turned towards just naturally. He's developed a natural passion for it. I knew he was going to win. I just had a feeling. Um, I've been watching him hit balls for a long time now, I'll, I'll know that, although not that long. But um, I could tell, you know, just being a golfer and any golfer who's seen him swing already, uh, you can just see something special there. 
Oh, bow shot, Jack. You really want your child to oh, just yeah. enjoy what they're doing. So if, if this is what he loves doing, I would absolutely yeah. love to see him pursue golf. Two years old, okay? So, I mean, who knows what his love is going to be when he's two and a half years old. But if you're old enough to remember the Mike Douglas talk show, you know where I'm headed then, right? Tiger Woods, two years old when he first appeared on Mike Douglas. You can find it on YouTube, and things worked out pretty well for him. That is the National for August the 16th. Good night.